Let's unite our hearts together, please, in a word of prayer. Let's all pray. Our gracious, eternal, loving, heavenly Father, we thank Thee for this Thy day and for Thy grace that finds us in the sanctuary, even this morning, to worship and praise Thee, our living God. We pray, Lord, at the outset that Thou might come and be one of our number. We pray, Lord, that Thy Spirit would be poured out upon us today, that we might worship Thee in spirit and in truth, and each soul would be conscious that the Lord is here. So, Lord, abide with us and bless us as we worship Thee. We pray in our Savior's name. Amen. Psalm 124, the second version. And if you have your hymn book, it's page 121. Now Israel may say, and that truly, if that the Lord had not our cause maintained, if that the Lord had not our right sustained, when cruel men who us desired to slay rose up in wrath to make of us their prey. We'll stand as we sing it. And for everybody else, it's on uh, the wall behind me. Let's again unite our hearts together, please, in a word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we do continue in Thy presence this morning in the Saviour's precious and all-prevailing name. We thank the Lord today there is but one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. We thank Thee that the veil has been rent in twain, 
and the way of access is opened up for us to come to the throne of heavenly grace. Thank the Lord, there is, thou hast said, I will meet with thee, and there I will commune with thee. And, O oh God, we, Lord, uh, lift up our hearts in adoration and praise and thankfulness for all that thou hast been to us in the week that has passed. Thank the Lord for thy preserving grace upon us, even in our goings out and our comings in. Thank the Lord for safety given. Thank the Lord for our material needs met. And, O oh God, we have food and we have a shelter over our head. And we have friends and family. And we have a place where we can come to hear the Word of God preached in all its fullness. And, O oh God, we thank Thee most of all for Thy great and wonderful plan of salvation. Thank the Lord that Thou dost ever set Thy love upon a lost sinful mankind. And by sending Thine only begotten Son, we thank Thee today for His perfect obedience in going to the cross of Calvary and there standing in our place and in our guilty stead. There He was even to bear away the punishment that we deserve. Oh, we praise Thee for Christ today. We thank the Lord for the finished work of Calvary. Thank the Lord it was a sacrifice once offered for sin that was acceptable in the Father's sight. And Lord, we praise Thee today that the tomb is empty and Christ is risen and He is seated at the Father's right hand. We're still living in the day of Thy grace. And we thank the Lord that Thou art yet calling souls unto Thyself. Lord, we, be, we bless Thee today for the liberty we enjoy because of the Protestant Reformation. Lord, we pray that Thou would help us to be those who will uh, hold the truth, that will earnestly contend for the faith that was once delivered for the saints. And Lord, we pray that Thou would help us to be good discerners of that which is error and that which is false. And we ask, Lord, that Thou would come and Thou would, Lord, enable us to be men and women of the book and we would be those that do know our God and do great exploits. Father, we pray that Thou would remember us even this morning. We pray for our congregation at large. We thank Thee for each and every one. And we are mindful of those who cannot join with us as yet. And we pray that Thy, Lord, presence will be known in each home. Thy speaking voice will be heard. For those that need Thy touch, O Lord, draw near to them even today. Comfort hearts, we ask of Thee. Think of our sister Sharon. Pray, Lord, that Thou would draw near to Thy child. Lord, that I would help her. Lord, that I would open up the way even for this procedure to take place. And we pray, Lord, that I would perfect that which concerneth her. Lord, give her that double portion of thy grace, even day by day. We ask, Lord, for even the Georges today. We ask for Ray today. Draw near to them. May they know thy, thy presence. May they know thy touch. And may, Lord, remember especially even Dr. Kearns. We pray, Lord, that I would draw near to him. Bless thy child in the intensive care unit. We pray, O oh God, that I would uh, lay liberally to him, Lord, in his need at this time. And Lord, that I and thy will would spare him uh, for many days yet to come. Remember, Mrs. Kearns, Lord, comfort her heart. Give her that peace that the Scriptures speak about, that peace that passeth all understanding, to know, Lord, that they are both in the hands of the eternal sovereign God. O oh God, draw near to them, we pray, their son as well. Draw near to other families that, O oh God, need thee at this time. We pray, Lord, for many homes that feel the empty chair and, Lord, have been bereaved of late. And we ask, Lord, that thou would continue to be a God of all comfort unto them. Remember our children. Remember our young people. Watch over them, O oh God. Pray, Lord, that thou would give that needed help even in, in, when the school returns and universities resemble, uh, resume. And, O oh God, we pray that thou would draw near to each one and they might, Lord, cast themselves upon thy mercy even in their goings out and in their comings in. Father, remember our land. Have mercy upon it. Lord, we recognize we have uh, done despite to thy word 
Backs have been turned to God. Lord, thou hast been forgotten and forsaken. Lord, we do not deserve the least of thy mercies. But Lord, thou art a merciful God. And we pray that thou would send us that heaven-sent revival blessing. In a dark day, we pray that, that, Lord, the glorious light of the gospel would shine as never before. And, Lord, we pray that many souls would even turn to the true and living God of heaven and of earth. We pray for our leaders today. They need that heavenly wisdom. They need, Lord, thy salvation in many cases. And, Lord, we pray that thou would reveal thyself unto them. So, Father, answer prayer. Be with us, we ask of thee. Bless and continue even thy presence with us this morning, and do our souls good. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Turning to Romans chapter 1, please, for scripture reading. I want to read just some of the opening verses here of the epistle to the Romans. And we begin at the first verse. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead, by whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name, among whom are ye also the called of Jesus Christ, to all that are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all, that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers, making request, if by any means now at length I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come unto you. If I long to see you, that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift, to the end ye may be established. That is, that I may be comforted together with you by the mutual faith both of you and me. Now I would not have you ignorant, brethren, that oftentimes I purposed to come unto you what was led hitherto, that I might have some fruit among you also, even as among other Gentiles. I am debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. So as much as in me is, I'm ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just, shall live by faith. Amen. Just ending our reading this morning at the end of verse 17. And we know the Lord will add his own divine blessing upon the reading of his precious, infallible word. Let me welcome you in the Savior's precious name this morning. It's good to see you in the house of God. Good to see your families joined out uh, in the house of God today. And we welcome each one, those in the prayer meeting as well. And we welcome those who are joining in through the various media outlets. We thank you for doing so. We pray that the Lord will draw near and bless your heart as well and that you'll feel a part of our service this morning. Especially those that are visiting with us, we give you a special word of welcome. And we trust and pray the Lord will draw near and bless us today. Do remember tonight, 7 o'clock, again in God's house. And we have simply entitled the message, God's Intervention, God's Intervention. Do your best to come out again and even bring others with you uh, for the evening service. Then a few announcements for the incoming week. Tuesday night, 8 o'clock, is the prayer meeting and Bible study again here in the the church church itself. 
uh, let me encourage you to come out to the place of prayer. There will be a short meeting of the committee just after that, as well as the MMT, More Missionary Trust. Uh, just uh, one or two minutes, brethren, will do uh, it, uh, certainly the committee, and uh, the other as well, God willing. So do please remember that, those whom that concerns. Wednesday night, no children's meeting, remember. Thursday, uh, Friday night, 8 o'clock, is our youth fellowship up in the complex. So do, again, remember your meeting, young people, this Friday night. Saturday night, there's no open air in the lower square. It will resume uh, Saturday week. Then next Lord's Day, it serves usual times, 12 and 7. Uh, and do remember the early season of prayer at 9 o'clock in the morning, and that's up in the complex as well. So do please remember the time of prayer and the services next Lord's Day. Sabbath school, 10 to 11 to 20 past 11, and continue uh, to bring the children out uh, to the Sunday school as it has uh, reconvened. The harvest services offering, uh, services on the offering lifted uh, came to a total of £5,836.45. £5,836. So that's a tremendous offering. We again uh, thank each one for your sacrificial giving. Um, we appreciate it. And uh, the Lord will bless you for it. And that will be going to Beulah and to the work of LTBS. Next Sunday afternoon, I should say also that the Sunday School Teachers Prayer Meeting will be at 330 uh, so please do remember that, Sunday School Teachers, next Lord's Day afternoon. This evening will be the last of the services to be relayed to the car park. Um, we, will, we are looking into other means uh, for the weeks ahead uh, for those who would continue to do that. Uh, but please do be aware of that. This tonight will be the last one that will be relayed. The new elders' ordination service will be, God willing, Sunday the 8th of November, in the evening time, the evening service. Uh, they have to do a training course between now and then, and then they'll be ratified by presbytery as other new elders will be from other churches. And our ordination service is penciled in, uh, God willing, as I say, for the 8th of November, that's Remembrance Sunday, and that will be the evening service at seven o'clock. The Lord's table will be held, God willing, on Sunday the 22nd, of November in the afternoon. We will give you more details concerning that, but it is something that the session had been actively looking at and praying about. Uh, we certainly want to have that communion feast and that means of grace are reinstated again. And so do again remember that date, please, the 22nd of November in the afternoon. That's Sunday afternoon, uh, God willing. The ordination of Andrew Murray will be taking place this Friday night. He has been called and he's answered that call in the affirmative to take up the ministry in Ardara. The service will be in Lurgan. It will be by uh, restricted, uh, restricted congregation. Uh, so you can join in by the means of sermon audio if you so desire this Friday night. I also got a note from uh, Lyle Boyd. And Lyle sent me a, a text there just the other day. Uh, reminding us of his farewell and of the welcoming services that are taking place this Saturday night. Uh, that's the 31st of October. It will be from Cartigas in Spain. Uh, most of it will be in Spanish, but that'll be no problem to most of you. Uh, the rest will be in English. Uh, so if you want to go again join in, you can do so uh, for those meetings. So it will be the farewell of Lyle and Heather as they come back here to Kilkeel and in Northern Ireland uh, after a great number of years, 30 plus years uh, down there. And then the welcome of our brother uh, who was here just a few weeks ago, uh, Alexandrio. And so he, him and his wife and family have arrived and they will be taking up the work uh, in the little church there in Cartagena. So do pray for them. Uh, and if you can, you can join in again through Facebook or some of those means for those services. I think that's all by way of announcement uh, today. 306, uh, I'm not ashamed to own my Lord or to defend His cause, maintain the honor of His word, the glory of His cross. Page 300, and you can see it on the screen there as well. We remain seated for the first part as we sing this, 306.
That sounds like a last one. I can turn you back to Romans chapter 1, please. We've been making reference to some of these verses. The gospel of the Reformation. Let's just unite our hearts in a word of prayer as we come to the preaching of God's Word. Father in heaven, we thank Thee again for Thy presence. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to sing these old hymns and psalms. And, O oh God, we pray that Thou would cause us to be that people We'll never be ashamed of the gospel of Christ. And Lord, we pray that others might come even to the foot of the old rugged cross and the light of the glorious gospel would infuse their very souls today. And they will be brought from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God. Pray, Lord, you thou would fill us with thy spirit and with power as we come to preach thy word. O oh God, give us every word from thyself. Shut out every distracting thought. Close us in with thee, Lord, that we might leave saying, it was good for me to be there, for there we met afresh with the Lord. Hear this our prayer. Give us words that must and shall prevail. Give us those prevailing words. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The name of Martin Luther is that name which perhaps is best known in connection with the great Protestant Reformation. Although by no means he wasn't the only man that God used to expose the darkness and to highlight the truth. In fact, if you take time to read some of the others, your soul will be blessed. Read about John Calvin. Read about Whitliffe and all the other men. And your soul will be blessed of God. But Luther uh, certainly is the one that's best remembered. The Reformation wasn't simply a reaction to the abuses of the day. The Reformation was ne neither was it a mere theological debate of the day. It was in truth a spirit-guided return to the religion of the Bible. The time was ripe for it because the people were asking the question, how can a sinner be justified and have peace with God? The fuel was abundant all over Europe, but it required a spark to set it alight. And that spark came on the 31st of October, 1517, when Luther the monk was to nail his 95 theses to the church door at Wittenberg in Germany in opposition to the deception of Rome. And hence, young people, that is why the Sabbath closest to the 31st is called Reformation Sunday. Don't forget it. Learn it. This is Reformation Sunday. Luther, by God's grace, had been led to see that he couldn't attain heaven by his good works. His conscience was never at peace, no matter how much he denied himself in penitence. The truth of God's word came and said to his soul, the just shall live by faith. And Luther was converted to Christ. Oh, he had no idea what was to follow. But the God who saved him was also the God who would use this converted monk to deal a blow to the Roman church from which he would never fully recover. And Luther's actions at Wittenberg was because the Pope was seeking to finance the building of St. Peter's in Rome. He sought to do this 
by selling what was known as indulgences to the people. The salesman was a man by the name of John Tetzel. And he went from town and city telling the people that they could have their sins pardoned if they would buy these seal letters or what the reformers came to call sin dockets. He said, and I quote, There is no sin so great that an indulgence cannot remit. Only pay well and all will be forgiven. He even sought to sell these sin dockets to those that were already deceased, to the family members. Luther was enraged by this. And soon he was heard preaching about it to the people from his pulpit. He then would take that bolder step and he would speak against them as a theologian. And thus in the day that I've already referenced, he nailed his 95 short statements against those indulgences to the church door. That church door is still there to this day. The blows of the hammer on that church door was symbolic of the cracking of the entire structure of Rome's edifice. Men and women, it is because of the Reformation that we are not in darkness, but that we have a liberty today and we have the light of the gospel truth. It is because of it that there are such places as Protestant churches, both in this land and in other countries throughout the world. Yet how sad that by and large, the Protestant Reformation is forgotten about. It's airbrushed over. There is the gospel of the Protestant Reformation. It ought to be considered and it ought to be preached. I want you to consider with me this morning the discovery. The short statements which Luther nailed to the church door were a continuous speech against the doctrine and the practice of the indulgences. And they highlighted the abuse of the clear teaching of the Word of God. Luther was to make it plain that there needed to be repentance on the part of the sinner if they were to know their sins forgiven. For example, number 32 of those short statements reads this. Thus, those who believe that through letters of pardon they are more sure of their own salvation will be eternally damned along with their teachers. Number 76, we affirm that par papal pardons cannot take away even the least daily sins as regards the guilt. And the grounds for such statements was the rediscovery of what God's Word said. The Church of Rome, even to this day, places much emphasis and authority upon the traditions of the Father's as, as they do upon Scripture. I tackled one of the priests in the old uh, Korean University some years back about that. Oh, and he sought to cover it up. And he sought to deflect what I was trying to say, that they place as much emphasis on the tradition of the fathers as they do upon the Word of God. Her people are not meant to read the Bible for themselves. And men and women, you give them a copy of the Scriptures and they'll cherish the Bible. What do we do with it? We put it on a shelf. We don't read it from one Sabbath to the next. Our Protestant people have despised the Word of God. Luther discovered the truth of the gospel. He discovered as he read these verses, and you can just picture him reading them. And thus he dismissed the traditions and he dismissed the superstitions of popery to hold forth the truth of God's Word. He married a fugitive nun. He had a family. He dispensed with the teaching of a celibacy among the priesthood. He wanted men and women to know God and to know that God was reconciling men and women unto Himself through the Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 19. He desired that people would know what it was to have peace with God and to have their sins pardoned. And this was brought out at His trial. 
and what was called the Dire of Worms. And young people, the worms, part of that simply is the name of the town. And the diet speaks of the trial or the gathering of it together. He refused to bend before the papacy. He refused to deny the principles which he had stood upon. He refused to take back what he had preached and what he had said. And his words were this, unless I am convinced by Scripture, which I have mentioned, and unless my conscience is made captive by God's Word, I cannot and will not recant, since it is hard, it is dangerous, unprofitable to act against one's conscience. Here I stand, I can do no other. God help me. Amen. He contended for the faith that was once delivered unto the saints. And a stand was founded upon the Word of God. The Scriptures taught him that there was no forgiveness of sin outside the Lord Jesus Christ. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission for sins. That pardon which the Savior purchased with His own precious blood could not be bought with money or given to Tetzel or to Rome. The foundation of the Reformation was not upon what man could do, but what God in Christ had already done. John 19, verse 30, Christ cried, It is finished! He had finished the work. He had finished the work that He came to do. Redemption and pardon for sins has been accomplished through his death on the cross, and thereafter he sat down at the right hand of God. It was through one putting their faith, their entire hope, their trust, whatever word you want to use, in that work of the Savior, that they can know forgiveness of sin, that they can know pardon from their sin. What can take away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And so men and women, you know today, that Christ has finished the work. He has obtained eternal salvation. He has obtained pardon for sin. But have you appropriated that to your own heart? Have you laid hold upon Christ, trusting in Him alone for eternal salvation and for the pardon of your sin? You see, Luther, a guilty soul, came to realize that was only because of the grace of God that he was to experience the peace and joy of sins forgiven. These truths were the foundations of that great awakening. Christ and the word of truth were the foundations of his faith. His conscience would not let him turn from it. He knew what it was to be brought out of darkness and into the light that Christ alone gives through his gospel. Let me ask you, what are you building your life upon today? What are you building your hopes upon? What are you building your eternity upon? If it's not Christ and His Word, then it is a feeling and it is a false hope. A sinking sand in the light of the storms of the great eternity that is to come. Let me remind you of 1 Corinthians 3 and 11. It says, For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. I simply ask, are you still in the darkness of your sin this morning? Or have you experienced the light of the gospel? It's either one or the other. Doesn't matter what your background has been, your country, your religion, you're either in the darkness of your sin or you've experienced the light of the gospel. The discovery. But then I want you to come with me a little further. And there's the doctrine, and the providence of God. When these indulgences were being sold throughout Germany, Luther was and had commenced lectures on the book of Romans. And he was to come to these words that we read this morning, particularly the words of verse 16 and 17. And words in verse 17, you'll notice, 
have already been written that tells us that they were and they are to be found in the Old Testament as well as in the New Testament. It says, For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, The just shall live by faith. He said in a preface to one of his books, Day and night I tried to meditate upon the significance of these words. And finally, God had mercy on me, and I began to understand that the righteousness of God is the gift of God by which a righteous man lives, namely faith. The gospel indicates that the merciful God justifies us by faith. Now I felt as though I had been reborn altogether and had entered paradise. That's what he wrote. Prior to the Reformation breaking forth, there was, as our text suggests, an ignorance as to the righteousness of God, a deception on the part of Romanism, how a sinner could be declared just in the sight of God. And Luther, like the people were going about seeking to establish their own righteousness before God. I wonder, do you know that in 1505, just 12 years prior to the date we've already mentioned to you, he entered an Augustinian monastery. He was to say himself, I was a good monk, and I kept the rule of my order so strictly that I may say that if a monk got to heaven by his monkery, it was I. If I had kept on any longer, I should have killed myself with vigils, prayers, reading, and other work. And yet through all afflictions and all the denials to himself and after all his penance and all his works, he still had no peace of heart. He still had no assurance of God's salvation. It wasn't until he came to know the truth of Romans 1, 16 and 17 by the power of God's Spirit. He was brought by the miracle of grace to know salvation in Christ alone. Verse 16 says, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. People, when they heard him preach, they knew that his faith wasn't in Rome. His faith wasn't in the popes. His faith wasn't in the indulgences. His faith was in the God of the Bible. His faith was in what God's Word had stated. And those truths and those doctrines that were now rediscovered by the Protestant Reformation were summed up in a very few short words. Scripture alone, faith alone, grace alone, Christ alone. It's Christ who is the center of the Reformation. He is the center of the Scriptures. They speak of Him. He's the center of justification by faith, by dying on the cross in the place of guilty, hell-deserving sinners. God was reconciling a lost mankind unto Himself. The Reformation was to show that all that people needed was God's only Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, men and women, that is the message of the gospel, and that is the message that is the power of God unto salvation. Look again at verse 16. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. It. It's not the preacher. It's not the church. But rather, the message is the power of God unto salvation. This truth, done away with the priests, done away with the popes of Rome, the Savior, as God's Word declares, is our great high priest. Let me turn you to Hebrews chapter 7 and the words of verse 24. It says, But this man, Speaking of the Savior, because he continueth ever hath an unchangeable priesthood, wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. For such an high priest became us, 
who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens, who needeth not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice, first for his own sins, and then for the people's. For this he did once, when he offered up himself. And the comparison is drawn there from the Old Testament times when the priesthood was a continuous inheritance inherited by others and it continued on. But here's the great high priest. Here's the one who offered but one sacrifice for sin. And he didn't offer it first for his own sins. He had none. He offered that sacrifice for the sins of those who would be redeemed. And because he is living, ever living, and because he ever lives in the office of the high priest, and because he was sinless, then he's able to save to the uttermost all that come unto God by him. And Luther and the reformers and all who heard the message were to look to Christ and to him alone. He recognized what Rome nor many Protestant clergy do not recognize to this day. And that is the significance of the little word, alone. He was justified as any sinner is by grace alone. For by grace are ye saved through faith, that not of yourselves, not of works, lest any man should boast. Let me read to you what he said himself upon the subject. He said, Now the article of justification, which is our sole defense, is this that by faith only in Christ and without works. We are pronounced righteous and saved. That's it in a nutshell. He went on to say, when the article of justification has fallen, everything has fallen. This is the chief article from which all other doctrines have flowed. It alone begets, nourishes, builds, preserves, defends the church of God. Without it, the church of God cannot exist for one hour. speaking about that central doctrine of justification by faith alone. Faith in Christ without works. A church without it can't exist for one hour. You know, I want to tell you this, and maybe you don't want me to tell you this, but I'm going to tell you anyway. It's only a few years back, and I'm talking about a few years. It might be three or four years But the Irish Presbyterian Church had a debate on the floor of the General Assembly about this very doctrine of justification by faith alone. And an amendment was tabled which in effect stated that the traditional Protestant reform teaching on this doctrine should be upheld. And when that amendment was put to the vote, you know what the result was? 163 for it, 161 were against it. The amendment was only carried by two votes. And then you wonder why sometimes we preach against the apostasy. Without that doctrine, it isn't a church any longer. Imagine the largest so-called Protestant church in this island and only carried it by two votes. The Reformed faith is that which we unashamedly preach in this church. The doctrines of grace that saw Luther liberated and the other Reformers and countless numbers of darkened souls ever since. These are the doctrines of the Scriptures. It is still the faith of the saints today. And the great difference between Romanism and the Reformed faith of Christ is the word alone. It's Christ alone. It's not Christ plus the Pope. It's not Christ plus the church. It's not Christ plus penitence. It's Christ alone. It's faith alone. 
It's grace alone without works. That's the great difference. It's grace alone that we are saved. It's in Christ alone because in Him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And you know, God's salvation is solely a gloria. It's to the glory of God alone. And there's the doctrine. And don't be put off by the word. It simply means the gospel. But let me show you this one final thought, and that is the deliverance. Because of the delusion and ecumenism that is abroad, there's the weakening of the Reformation principles. There's a weakening of the truths which Luther stood upon. It pushes on to have us back in union with Rome. To be under its control and sway again. The buzzword is, well, you've got to be more tolerating. Roman Catholic Church, can I repeat unashamedly, is not a Christian church. I don't care what the commentators say. I don't care what your broadcasters depict when they have them interviewed. I don't care what other pulpits say. It is not a, a Christian church. And that is, it does not follow the teaching of Christ. And you don't need me to tell you that. Because that has been made abundantly clear even in the past week. When the Pope's latest interview endorses same-sex unions. And it is an advocate of a false and wicked doctrine. Which God is against. The apostle whom the Pope is supposed to have succeeded. Mind you, he had a wife. For we read about his mother-in-law. So there's something wrong there right away. But he's supposed to have succeeded Peter. Peter was never the prominent disciple. But Peter is obviously at odds with what the Pope believes. You see, I read Peter's own words through the leading of the Holy Spirit in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4. It says, For of God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. Spared not the old world, but saved Noah the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. Listen, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overflow, making them an ensample unto those that after should live ungodly. God is against Sodomai. He condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. They're there as an example of the wrath of God. And you can search Israel, and you can search the surrounding area, you'll not find them. They're gone. They're wiped off the face of the earth. And Peter wrote that. For a church, or for anyone, to declare and to take upon themselves the name of a Christian, then they must follow the teachings of Christ. It stands to sense. And that is certainly something that the church of Rome cannot lay claim to. Rome denies the finality of Christ's atoning sacrifice at Calvary. In every Mass, there is a reenactment of putting the Savior to death upon that cross. When God's Word states, so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of men. When it says in Hebrews 10 and 12, But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. Doesn't need to be repeated. She also encourages her people to pray to Mary and the saints. My Bible tells me that there's one God and one mediator between God and men, 
the man Christ Jesus. She teaches her people that good works and being faithful to the church can get them to heaven when the scriptures declare not by works lest any man should boast. When the Savior said, I am the way, the truth and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Should we forget the Reformation? Should we remain silent about it and just put it into the corner? Silence in the defense of the Lord and His Word is surely something which is displeasing in His sight. If we stand up for the truths of Christ, it will of necessity bring us into conflict with Romanism. The Lord speaking to His disciples said, it is impossible but that offenses will come. In other words, they cannot be avoided. It is either seeking that righteousness of ourselves that we've been reading about in verse 17 in uh, uh, this passage, that righteousness of ourselves, or else it's submitting to the righteousness that is of God through Christ and knowing His deliverance. The words of 2 Corinthians 6 and 14 says, For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? See the word communion. It means fellowship. It means joint participation. It means intercourse. Darkness and light have no intercourse. They have nothing in common. As it is in the physical, so it is in the spiritual. We cannot defend truth by being joined or linked unto error. To defend the truth, there must needs be separation from that which is erroneous. There needs to be a separation from those who have gone back on their ordination vows and from those who seek unity with Rome in this end time apostasy. And young people, you be very careful. You be very careful. For there's young people will be attracted to you and they'll seek to draw you back into the apostasy. They'll seek to draw you back to the churches that your parents come out of. And started this church and started this denomination because they knew and they saw the errors. And very little has changed. And young people, you need to be on your guard. And you need to know what you believe and why you believe it. The mainstream churches are hand in hand with Rome, they make no apology for it. They make no apology. The Lord says, touch not the unclean sign. Now, which are we going to follow? How can a Reformed Protestant church be in fellowship with a church which denies that salvation is by faith alone, in Christ alone? It's impossible. I stand upon the Reformed faith. I stand upon the teaching of these verses. That which was rediscovered and which directed the people away from papal rule and authority to the only head and the only king of his church, even the Lord Jesus Christ in the time of the Reformation. And listen, it's to that Savior that I still point men and women. And I direct you to him this morning. If you're not converted, whoever you are, under the sound of my voice, whether Protestant, Catholic, whatever, I want to remind you, I tell you, you need to be saved. And salvation is of God. It's all of God. On the Geneva Memorial are the words, after darkness, light. It's a memorial to the Reformed. That is what you, sinner, can experience this morning if you will repent of your sin and if you will turn by faith even to Christ Himself. You see, that's the power of God's salvation. And that's the gospel of the Reformation. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. 
wonder if you're not saved, will you come now? Take Christ as Lord, as Savior, and as King. May the Lord bless His Word to our hearts this morning. Let's just unite our hearts together in closing word of prayer. Our God and our Father, we thank Thee again for Thy precious Word. We thank the Lord for the rediscovery of its truths. We bless the Lord for raising men such as Martin Luther, as John Wycliffe, as John Calvin, Melanchthon, so, much, so forth. O oh God, we praise the Lord for those men that were raised in England, for those of John Knox's ilk in Scotland. And we thank the Lord that they founded their preaching on the Word of God. There was a return to the Scriptures. There was a return even to the gospel of the Reformation and the gospel of Pentecost and the gospel of Christ that is found in Thy Word. And we praise the Lord that it is still the power of God unto salvation. And we pray, Lord, that we might be those who do know the book, who do know our God. And we believe it, and we know why we believe it. I pray, Lord, for our young people in particular. That would guard, that would give wisdom. Lord, I pray that that would draw good young people out of the apostasy. That in not a call of a free Presbyterian minister, but in, in obedience to the call of the Scriptures, to the call of God, that they might separate. And they might, Lord, be separated unto Christ outside the camp. Lord, we have seen it in our own history. Lord, do it again. Do it again. And we pray, Lord, there will be young people that would come out of these old churches and they would go through with God their vows to pay. They're all upon God's altar lay. Speak to the unconverted. Bring them to Christ. Oh, visit us, Lord, with salvation power today. Part us now with thy blessing, thy favor. We ask these things in our Savior's precious name.